So I decided that I wanted to do something to raise, to raise, to raise awareness about aphasia. So I applied you for this. You have aphasia. You have aphasia. Thank you. Is this going to make it to the final edit? <laughs> yes, I have aphasia. <laughs> Very often. I watched your uh, movie after word after yes. word uh, tell me more about it. it it is very interesting thank you very much uh, so back in 2000 which i can't believe is 21 years ago mm. i applied for a small grant from the national stroke association yeah. to do a community awareness public awareness project so i got this grant a modest grant and i put together a program called Faces of Aphasia at Boston University. And it was a program involving the arts, including mm -hmm. music, theater, uh, the visual arts, mm -hmm. and um, poetry. Mm -hmm. And we were very fortunate because one of the people in the aphasia group at that time was a woman who had been a mezzo-soprano noted opera singer mm -hmm. who had had a stroke yeah. and was aphasic. And she was interviewed by the Boston Globe music critic. And his interview appeared on the front page of the Boston Globe, yeah. which resulted in a full house at mm. this event. And I was so proud and flattered. And then I had, I had videotaped it, mm. but it was too long. It was two and a half hours. And it was, I felt it needed to be shortened. Yeah. So I asked a friend of mine who was in, who was a filmmaker, mm -hmm. if he could edit this down so we could use it for teaching. Yeah. And he looked at it and he said, yes, I can edit it, but this is such a fascinating topic. I think we should make a movie yeah, about make aphasia. A movie. Yay. So that was the origins of Afterwords. We sought out various people living with aphasia, including some noted celebrities like famous actors of their day, Patricia Neal and Julie Harris and Bobby McFerrin, a musician. And we put together this film. Mm -hmm. And then that got a fair amount of publicity. And then about 10 years later, in 2012 or 13, mm -hmm. we decided to make a uh, sequel. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which one you saw, the first yeah, one or the second uh, one. Afterward and after World 2. Yeah, you saw both of them. Yeah. And what we did was we, we used parts of the original and, and added new parts of it because the, the, what we, the, we felt that the landscape of aphasia treatment had changed in the last 10 years. Mm. So that's ho how those films came to be. And I still have a goal. I'd like to make one more documentary i think the time is right it's been another 10 years mm -hmm. um but i have to find the right filmmaker and the, the right way of presenting aphasia in a way that's going to be understandable and accessible mm -hmm. to the public mm -hmm. so that's my dream that's my goal is to make another documentary Afterworld, it is the older people, but uh, Afterworld 2 is the younger folks. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. and there's a reason for that, because in the last 15, 20 years, we have observed, and there is, um, there is um, um, research and statistics to, to back this up, yeah. that stroke and aphasia and certainly traumatic brain injury are increasing in younger people. Yeah. And there are various theories about why this is happening. Stress, different aspects of, of life these days. Uh, maybe the fact that we are distracted and drivers are distracted and pedestrians are distracted. There are more injuries and people are surviving these injuries longer so that we're having sort of an epidemic mm -hmm. of aphasia and cognitive deficits due to stroke and head injury uh, mm -hmm. more than we did two decades ago.
Well, the CSD, the Communication Science Disorders Graduate Program at Sargent College at BU, is uh, for most students a two-year program. Mm -hmm. This is a graduate program. So a lot of these young people, some of whom may have done their undergraduate work at BU, but many of them come from other parts of the country where they went to other schools. And then they come to Boston, which has four graduate programs in speech mm -hmm. pathology. I think ours is the best, but that's another, that's another story. Um, they have a two-year program in which they take all sorts of courses which cover a wide range of areas, not just aphasia. In fact, I don't think, and I could be wrong, I don't think they really have an aphasia course until their second year. Mm. So they'll be taking courses uh, uh, like anatomy and physiology of the speech mechanism, uh, child development, ch language acquisition in children, uh, speech and phonological disorders in children, fluency, voice disorders. Um, speech pathology has lots of different specialties. Um, if they are interested and if they know about it, many of them will observe us and our clients at the Aphasia Resource Center, but most of them don't really take an aphasia course mm -hmm. or start to do clinical practice with people with aphasia until they're in their second year. Either they have a placement in a hospital or a rehab hospital in the Boston area, or they'll come to the Aphasia Center. And as you know, we've had lots of students. Um, so they get a general introduction to speech language pathology, mm -hmm. And then they get coursework in aphasia and voice and fluency and child language and et cetera, et cetera. And then they choose from their experiences which area they would like to uh, specialize in once they, um, once they graduate. By the way, the uh, SLP uh, mostly female, but not male. Why is that? That's an age old question. Uh, it's been that way as long as I've been in the field. I remember in, when I went to even undergraduate, but graduate school at North New York University, there were maybe two or three guys. I don't really know the reason why uh, it's such a female dominated uh, field. It just always has been. Maybe it's because it's an outgrowth of, of uh, kind of a nurturing profession as opposed to a money-making profession that doesn't mean, <laughs> you know, um, uh, the, the professional associations from the American Speech Language and Hearing Association and other uh, groups have tried to explore and attract more uh, men. I don't even know if that's uh, politically correct anymore, but people of all sorts of genders uh, uh, into the field. I think it's changing, but very, very slowly. 